started this morning, I'm going to say a couple of things. First of all, I meant to say it last week, and I would, would say it every week, but it would probably become uh, a little too much. But uh, I just want to say how good a job Martha and Della do this morning on Sunday. Thank you guys so much for leading us in worship. Uh, and then also this morning, as you all know, yesterday was Veterans Day, so I would just like to just take a moment and say thank you to our veterans. Could we, uh, I'd like to ask if, if there are any veterans in the room, if you could just raise your hand or stand, uh, whichever for so we can recognize you. Thank you guys so much for your service. Uh, I, honestly, I can't even imagine uh, where our country would be without uh, those men and women who stand in our, in our place to fight for our freedom, so thank you guys very much. I just want to pray for you and pray for our uh, current military uh, at this moment, just to say thank you to God for them. Father, we do lift up our veterans to you, Lord, those who are in service and those who have served so well in the past. Lord, I want to lift up their families to you. Thank you for them, their, their strength to endure through those times. Father, I do thank you for the fact that there are men and women willing to stand up and be ready to fight if necessary or for our freedoms. Father, most of all, we thank you for protecting us, for our freedoms that we enjoy. Lord, let us use those that these men, that, that many have fought and died for, that those who have fought for and served for, Lord, that we would use those freedoms for your glory so that people would know who Jesus is that these men and women who have served would not have served in vain. Lord, we love you, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, we continue through our study through John. Last week, we talked about how Jesus turns our sorrow to joy. Um, just a wonderful reminder to us, to, our, to his disciples there, the, the, the last supper, uh, those last moments before uh, he is about to be taken. And this morning we, we actually take up a passage right at the end of this final uh, night's worth of teaching before we get into one of the greatest chapters in the entire Bible in John 17 where Jesus finishes his teaching by praying for his disciples. Uh, before we get there, we have one more passage of Scripture uh, to cover before chapter 17. So if you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to John 16, verses 25 to 33. Uh, but I'm going to read a passage out of Romans before we jump into this passage this morning. I believe that Jesus here to his disciples is about to do something that uh, changes three vital things for his disciples and also does the same for us today. So if you you turn to John 16, verse, beginning in verse 25, and I'm going to turn over real quickly to Romans chapter 8 and read a passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. It says this, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This morning, we are going to discuss, back in John chapter 16, 
about how Jesus has overcome. And this morning I hope that we would understand how because Jesus has overcome, we also may overcome. So would you turn to John 16, if you're already there, John 16, <clears throat> verses 25 through 33 is the passage we're going to talk about this morning. But if you'll stand with me, I'm just going to read verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome. Father God, this morning, as we come to this passage of Scripture, help us to overcome Lord, help us understand how Jesus has overcome so that we can understand how we also may overcome this world. Lord, teach us what it is to have faith. Teach us what it is to love. Teach us what it is to hope this morning. Lord, let us, like your disciples 2,000 years ago, sitting in that upper room, help us to sit and listen and take it in as Jesus teaches us what it looks like. Father, I pray this morning, if there's anyone in this room that does not know you personally as their Lord and Savior, that you would draw them to yourself and save them this morning. And Father, for those of us who are believers, I pray that you would draw us closer to yourself and help us understand our identity that much better. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So let me back up to verse 25. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 25 and 28 first. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. So far in Jesus' ministry, <clears throat> excuse me, these men have heard Jesus speak many times in parables or figures of speech, and didn't always understand what Jesus was teaching. Sometimes Jesus would explain his teaching, and sometimes he just did. He kept them in figures of speech and in parables in order to keep those who would not believe from understanding and to, to let those who would believe understand. But there are some things that they still didn't get. So he's saying now, Jesus is telling them that now at the, the end, this last teaching moment, I've said all these things to you in figures of speech, is there's going to come a time the hour is coming when I'm not going to speak like that, but I'm going to tell you plainly about the Father. What does he tell us plainly about the Father? He says, in that day you will ask in my name. Remember last week we ended our, our lesson here in, in verses 23 and 24 talking about prayer and asking in Jesus' name. <clears throat> and how they hadn't had to ask in Jesus' name yet because he was right there with them. But now he's saying, and I do not say that I will ask. Or, I'm sorry. In that day you will ask in my name, and I, and, and I do not say that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you. Jesus. Jesus, in his death, burial, and resurrection, removed the veil. The veil that separated man from God. Ripped it right down in two. You all know that. And gave us direct access to the Father. Jesus is saying, is what I'm about to do. What I'm about to do is make it possible for you to speak directly to the Father. You don't, you don't have to speak through me anymore. You don't have to, 
you can go directly to God in prayer. We have direct access. Why? For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So the first thing I want us to understand is that Jesus turns hate to love. Jesus turns hate to love. Listen, it doesn't say anything about hate here. But what, what does the Bible teach us about God and love? He says, now the Father himself loves you because you've loved me. Well, what was it before? It was hate. Two things. Sinners hate God. And you might not like to hear this, but God hates sinners. And that's not my opinion. I'm going to give you scripture here in just a minute. But, but, but listen. Sinners hate God. And God hates sinners. Sinners hates God. First, there's going to be a lot of scripture today, and I hope you're ready. You don't have to flip there with me, but I'm going to tell you where we're going. Romans chapter 3, first of all, verses 10 through 18. Sinners hate God. You don't believe me? Here's what Romans 3 says, verses 10 through 18. None, excuse me, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Sinners hate God. But God also hates sinners. This isn't a popular opinion among Christians today, or among people at all today. Listen to what the Word says. Proverbs eleven twenty 20 is the first place. Those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord. But those of blameless ways are His delight. Look at Psalms chapter 5, verses 4 and 6. 4 to 6, excuse me. Here's what it says. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Listen to this. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Sinners hate God, and God hates sinners. <laughs> that's not a good situation. But that's what Jesus came to change. What Jesus is about to do, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ, what he is about to do is about to change that. He is about to change the whole thing. Sinners who hate God. God who hates sinners. What can be done about that? We are separated from God by our sin. In this world, we, we, we are not with Him. We, we understand that through the fall, we were separated from God. We no longer, no longer have a relationship with Him. In fact, like I said, we hate Him. And He hates us. So something has to change that. Now, I know I've said that in, in, a, in, in sort of a way that kind of makes you cringe a little. God hates us. <laughs> but he doesn't hate us the way we think of hate. Because Jesus tells us in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We know that verse. But why is that verse so important? Because sinners hate God and God hates sinners. And you cannot have a relationship. Sinners cannot have a relationship with God because of those two truths. So Jesus 
had to lay down his life. God loved us in this way. That's what the so means. He loved us like this. This is how he showed his love. Even though he hates sinners, this is how he showed his love for people. That he gave his only begotten son to die on a cross. To be buried and raised again three days later. So that his wrath, his hatred, his anger towards sinners would be appeased. So we, we say often, you know, Jesus, God doesn't see us anymore. He sees the blood of Jesus, right? That's why that's important. Because otherwise, we're under the wrath of God. If it wasn't for the sacrifice of His only begotten Son, the wrath and anger and indignation that we deserve would be completely on us. But because of what Jesus did, His blood covers us, and now... We are seen no longer as sinners, but as saints because of Jesus. He turns sinners into saints. He turns the unlovable into lovable. So Romans 8.1 says, There's now therefore no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Not those of us who have just said, Well, I want to be a better person and I want to believe in God. No. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus, those of us... Who Jesus died for, that we have believed it, it, that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that we put our faith and trust in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone and repented and turned our life over to Him. We are now loved by God because of Jesus. Jesus literally turned hatred into love. The Father's wrath has now been turned into love and care and concern. And we no longer have to come to Him in fear, but we can go before Him boldly in prayer because of what Jesus did. Not only that, He did not only turn sinners into saints and the unlovable into lovable, but He's turned us who were unable to love Him back into ones that are able to love. He's poured, as Romans 5.3 says, His love into our hearts through His Holy Spirit. He's turned selfish haters into selfless lovers. He's changed us. He's made us loving. Because of His love for us, He's made us loving. And who gets all the credit for this? It's the Spirit that's in us to love us, to love Him. It's Jesus who died on the cross to make God love us. And it's God the Father who sent Jesus to do that. So who gets the credit for it? Not me. God. He does. He gets all the glory for it. Jesus turns hate to love. Our former situation is no longer the same. We who were... Lost in our sin, are now loved and beloved by God, and love God in return. Jesus changed that. But he, he doesn't just turn hate to love, he also turns doubt into faith. Look at what verse 29 and 30 says. His disciples said, Ah! Now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. <laughs> this is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus turns doubt to faith. turns doubt to faith, and first of all, because of what Jesus did, what he did, what he spoke, and what he showed. Jesus took the time to teach his disciples. Because of uh, his teaching, their doubt is now turning to faith. Because of the, the, the way he taught them, their, their doubt is overcome by faith. He taught them again, and again, and again, and again, about what's going to happen, and what and who he was, and this 
teaching, uh, that Jesus' teaching changed their misunderstanding, their doubts, their fears, all those other things, into faith. We believe. The disciples said. In fact, this whole gospel written by John is written the way it is with the teachings of Jesus that it has, with the miracles of Jesus that it has, in order to do exactly that, to turn doubt to faith. Verse, uh, excuse me, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31 says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the, the very purpose that John wrote this gospel is so that he can tell other people what Jesus said and what he did so that they would believe. The same thing that happened with the disciples. The disciples sat under his teaching and watched his miracles, and because of that, they believed. They saw what Jesus did, they heard what Jesus said, and their doubt turned into faith. But it's not only because of what Jesus did and said, it's because of who Jesus is. He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. The God-Man. God with us. Emmanuel. He is our advocate. He is the one that stands in our place between us and God. He is the one that made that connection as we just talked about turning hate to love for us. He, he, he didn't just turn hate into love. He turned our doubts into faith. He made it possible for us to believe. He's the only one that could. He's the only one who is both God and man. So because of what he said, what he did, and because of who he is, these disciples' doubt was turned to faith. And for us, it's the same thing as we read what Jesus said. As we read about what Jesus did, as we read uh, about who he is, and as we experience that in our own personal life, our doubts are overcome by faith. Not just in the, 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 the original salvation sense, not just in, in the uh, coming to Christ for salvation, but in every aspect of our life. When we, when we are faced with whatever we're faced with, and we need to be able to overcome this. We, we doubt what's going to happen. We're not sure of what to do. What do we need to do? Go read what Jesus said. <clears throat> Go read about what Jesus did. Meditate on who Jesus is. And your doubt will turn to faith. Because it's not about you or how you can overcome it. It's about Jesus. It's about faith in what he has done. And who he is. Not in what you can do. You or I can do on our own. Jesus turns our doubt into faith. Verses 31 to 34. Jesus not only turns our hate to love and our doubt to faith, but Jesus turns our desperation into hope. Look at these disciples. Uh, look what Jesus said to his disciples here in verse 33, uh, 31 to 30. Jesus answered them. After them just saying, we believe you came from God. Jesus answered them. Do you now believe? Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it is come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus turns our desperation to hope. He turns the disciples' desperation into hope. He, first, he says, that he says, do you now believe? You've been with me for three and a half years. Now you believe. Do you believe? Well, the hour's coming, Jesus says to them. Indeed, it has come. You're going to be scattered. You, you believe in me. You believe now. What's about to happen is I'm going to be taken 
to be uh, associated we, with me might cost you your life. So what's going to happen is you guys are just going to scatter. You're going to run away. And he doesn't say it here, but in another, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in the other, another gospel, he tells Peter specifically, you're, you're even going to doubt me. You're going to tell people to their face you don't know who I am. He, he tells his, his disciples that they are about to go through some a desperate situation. That they're going to be faced with persecution. They're going to be faced with, with, with having to tell people that they know him, even if it's going to cost them their life. So they're going to be scattered. This is about to happen. You're going to be scattered and leave me alone. They're going to desert him. Jesus is about to be handed over for his crimes. And he's going to be there all alone. Nobody else is going to be there with him. They're all going to run and hide because, <clears throat> excuse me, because being associated with Jesus is going to cost their life. But Jesus says here, yet I'm not alone. That Jesus is about to face the most difficult situation, difficult moment of his life on earth. tells his disciples, y'all aren't going to be with me. I'm going to be alone. But I'm not really going to be alone. Because the Father is with me. The Father is with me. God the Father is with him through what he's going to go through. Remember, Jesus is human and divine. And what does he do? He puts his trust in the Father, not in the people around him. People are going to let us down. They're going to scatter. They're going to, they're going to desert us. They're not going to do exactly what we want them to do. They're not going to treat us the way we want to be treated all the time. But you know what? The Father is with us. When you face things, Jesus is about to face the worst of all things. He's about to be led into a suffering that we can't even imagine to lay down his life for the, the sins of mankind. He's not alone in it. God the Father is with him. And so, Jesus says in verse 33 to his disciples, I'm saying these things to you now that you may have peace. It's going to look desperate. The situation is going to look dire. It's going, you're going to scatter. You're going to flee. You're going to be scared to death because you might be put to death for knowing me. But don't be afraid. Don't don't enter into, like I said, desperation. There's hope. I'm saying these things to you so that you'll have peace. Peace. How? How in the world are we going to have peace through that situation? Through those circumstances? You're going to be put up to death. He's going to be... That we're going to just scatter and be afraid that you're going to die there alone. How in the world are we going to have peace? Because Jesus knew what was on the other side of it. He wasn't being put to death and, and they were going to be gone and alone. He was come to do what he came to do. He came to lay down his life for all mankind. And so he knows what's about to take place is so that they may have peace. Listen to what he says in the rest of the verse. In the world you will have tribulation. Remember last week we talked about the promise of sorrow. Well, now he's promising tribulation. You're going to have problems in this world for following me. You will have tribulation. There will be difficult times. You're going to have to stand up and say no to doing certain things. You're going to have to stand up and be counted as a follower of Christ, even if it costs you your job or a friend. Or money, or time, or comfort. You will have tribulation. I still don't see the peace. But take heart. I like that. I, I like that phrase. We don't say that anymore. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus, Jesus is telling his disciples, and he tells us, 
the same thing. You're going to have tribulation. There's going to be distress. You're going to be in a desperate situation. There's going to be times where it's going to be hard. It's going to be overwhelming. But take heart. Why? I have overcome the world. What, what does that mean? He's about to be put up to death. How in the world have you overcome the world? Well, this is Jesus once again because he's God is saying, I have overcome the world, and what I'm about to do is to, is to overcome sin and death and hell. There's no power that's going to be able to separate you from the love of Christ, as we read in Romans chapter 8. None of that's going to happen because I have overcome the world, even though it hasn't happened yet. What Jesus is about to do, just hours later, is going to overcome the world. He wins. His death, his burial, his resurrection is to win. So what does that mean? How else should I take heart because he's overcome? Because you're in Christ. When he wins, we win. When he won, we won. Now this isn't a... a, a, a Pick yourself up by your bootstraps and try hard to win and you'll win because God's going to let you win. No, I'm saying sin and hell and Satan have no power in our lives because Jesus' death overcame all of that. And when Jesus died on the cross and was buried and rose again three days later, I did too. We're in Christ. We're overcomers, as Romans 8 says, through Christ. It's all about Him. He did it. Jesus overcame. He turns our desperation into hope because whatever we're facing, we already know we win. We already won. Jesus already won. So we've already won. If we're in Him. I'm going to read a whole bunch of verses all real quickly just to show you what I'm talking about. Our faith is what overcomes the world. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Word says. First, first of all, we're going to 1 John. I'm going to try not to get caught up in it. I've got all these little orange tabs, but I didn't write anything on them, so just uh, roll with me here. 1 John 5, verse 4 says this, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this, and, and this is the victory that has overcome the world. Not our trying heart. Not our good status in the community. Not our ability to do a job really well. Not our money, not our finances, not anything else. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. What is our faith based on? Jesus. Who gave us our faith? Jesus. Who gets the credit? Jesus. Who's overcome the world? Jesus. So why do we overcome the world? Because of Jesus. Okay, Matthew 16, verse 18 says this. Like I said, just write down these verses because I'm going to be all over the place. Matthew 16, 18 says this. And I tell you, this is Jesus talking to Peter. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. Listen to this. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Church, hell won't defeat us. It can't. Jesus already beat it. Oh, gosh. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It just keeps getting better and better and better. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 to 57. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death. Where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is not just for the next day. Our hope is for eternity. Death can't defeat us. Hell can't defeat us. Satan and sin can't defeat us. Our victory is in Jesus, and he's already won. Oh, victory in Jesus. We sing 
that song a lot. Do we know that we have victory in Jesus? One more. No, two more. Romans chapter 16. Verse 20. This is one of my favorites. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. We have victory over Satan. Not because of us, but because of the one who gave us the victory, Jesus. I hope I'm saying his name enough that you recognize that it's not about you or me. It's Jesus. One more. Revelation. To the very end, we have hope in Jesus. He turns our desperate situation, our desperation, this life that we live, to hope. Revelation 12. Verses 10 and 11. Of course, we know that Revelation is written by John. St. John. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him. Who's they? You and me. They. That's, that's you guys. That's me. Have conquered him. Who's him? Satan. How? And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. His death, His blood that was shed. We, are con we conquer Him, the enemy. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by Jesus, and, listen, and by the word of their testimony. Well, what's our testimony? That's Jesus too. It's, it's the blood of Jesus and our testimony about Jesus that overcomes and and. and, and gives us victory. It's not even over yet. And they, they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives, even unto death. Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, laid down his life. That's our testimony. And we live our entire life, not for us, but for him. Our faith him or comes the end even unto death man Jesus turns our desperation to hope because he's already won Jesus is overcome he turns a hating doubting desperate people into loving, faithful, hopeful people. Do you believe? Do you now believe? The same question that Jesus asked his disciples on that night is the same question we need to ask ourselves. Do you believe? Do you now believe? believe that Jesus has overcome? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? If you have, do you still believe? Do you believe that your situation now can be overcome? Do you believe that the, this, the, the temptation in your life right now can be overcome? Do you believe that your life still has purpose to overcome to the very end. Do you believe Jesus? Or not? I'm going to sing a song. This is part of my sermon. You may never have had this done before. And that's okay. But as I was preparing this message, there's a lyric of a song that kept resonating through my mind again and again and again and again and again. 
one day all this will be over. And those of us who are in Christ, <laughs> who have won the victory, who have overcome through Him, are going to rise.
So this morning, the question is just do you believe? Do you believe that? I pray you do. I hope you do. If you already did, I just pray you believe it that way. 